um, for the next event in the series. Without further ado now, I'd like to introduce Vinny Schiraldi, who is, as uh, many of you know, uh, an expert in this topic, a national leader in criminal and juvenile justice and legal reform and mass incarceration reform, who has worked in the field for more than four decades. He is currently the Secretary of Juvenile Services for the state of Maryland. He joined the Moore Miller administration from Columbia University, where he was the senior research scientist at the Columbia School of Social Work and co-director of the Columbia Justice Lab. Their work focused on reducing the footprint and negative impact of community corrections, eliminating youth prisons, and creating a developmentally appropriate response for emerging adults. Mr. Sheraldi went to Columbia from our program, the Harvard Kennedy School Program in Criminal Justice, where he had been a senior researcher and has extensive government experience, having served as the commissioner of New York City's Department of Correction, where he has worked to close Rikers and end the practice of solitary confinement. He also served as director of juvenile corrections in Washington, D.C., as commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation, and as senior policy advisor to the mayor's office of criminal justice in New York City. He also pioneered efforts at community-based alternatives to incarceration in New York City and Washington, D.C. as founder and executive director of the Center on Juvenile and Criminal Justice and the Justice Policy Institute and has lectured at uh, universities around the country. And we are so grateful for your time and your expertise joining us today, Vinny. Thank you so much for being here. Um, would you like to begin with uh, kind of an introduction of the piece or do you want to jump right into the presentation? Yeah, maybe I'll just jump right into the presentation since I was a little late today and Sorry for that. At uh, running a department now, it's a new world. So uh, stuff calls, stuff calls. No problem. We're really glad to have you join us. Go ahead and take it away. All right. Thanks a lot. And thanks for that introduction. I appreciate it. I appreciate coming back home to the program in criminal justice. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with an excerpt from my book uh, that I think lays out a bit of the conversation I'd like to have with everybody today. Uh, and that'll save you the time and money of having to buy and read the book. So you can cut right to the end there. Um, so here's an excerpt. Is community supervision an act of mercy or an extension of punishment? Does it aim to rehabilitate? Uh, let me see. Let me just, how do I go to the next? There you go. Um, does it aim to rehabilitate and reintegrate people who have broken the law back into mainstream society? or to surveil, deter, and ultimately incarcerate minor rule breakers? Does it reduce incarceration by serving as a kinder and less intensive brand of community corrections? Or is it merely a delayed form of incarceration? Does it soften the harsh blow of the penal system on black and brown people? Or is it part of an expansive system that excessively controls people of color and their communities? Something that exacerbates and extends rather than ameliorates systemic racism. If we abolished it, would we be able to replace it with more decent and effective community supports or would more people be incarcerated either because they weren't diverted or released for want of community supervision or because they got rearrested? And why do we know so little definitively about these important question, questions for the largest part of our carceral state, which contributes more people to prison through non-criminal technical violations than the entire prison population of 1972 prior to the advent of mass incarceration. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna take you through uh, some of the, some of the uh, issues raised in my book and in this paper that um, Evangeline Evie Lapu, me and Tim Itner wrote uh, called How Loose, Little Supervision Can We Have? Uh, that's now available to you in the uh, annual review of criminology. My book comes out in, uh, in the fall. So here's the, uh, Here's, the, here's what I wanna walk you through. I'll talk a little about the current carceral populations, the origins of community supervision and how they've sort of affected the field throughout their existence, uh, the death of rehabilitation that came about during the 1970s, the impacts of supervision on uh, individuals, case examples of reform and near abolition and where I think this takes us from here. So uh, let me start first by defining probation and parole. Uh, probation is a front end sentence that diverts people from incarceration, or at least it was designed to divert people from incarceration by supervising them and uh, putting them uh, under conditions in the community. Parole is a back end release mechanism for people who have participated in programs and played by the rules while they're incarcerated. 
Both were ostensibly designed to reduce the use of incarceration, probation at the system's front end and parole at its back end, and to do so in a way that promoted public safety by rehabilitating people who had broken the law. Here we see, however, uh, that as mass incarceration ramped up from 1980 to its peak around the mid 2000s, so did probation and parole, incarceration rising five, about fivefold, while community supervision rose about fourfold. Of course, if probation and parole were truly impacting prison and jail populations uh, by reducing them as they were designed to do, you'd see incarceration declining as community supervision roles rose. Instead, probation and parole largely track prison and jail populations, suggesting that they are an add-on rather than an alternative to incarceration, or as the University of Wisconsin Cecilia Klingel calls them, merely a delayed form of incarceration. At the end of 2020, there were about 1.7 million US residents in prison and jail, and about twice as many, 3.9 million of us, or one out of every 66 adults, under community supervision. So this is down, it was over 5 million uh, in, in the early 2000s. Uh, but this is also a fuzzy number because it doesn't include people out on bail, uh, people under pretrial supervision, or in many states, it doesn't include people supervised by private probation companies. Okay, so why do we even use supervision? Uh, the equivocal questions I started with, is it a net widener? Is it an alternative to incarceration? Does it help people? Does it punish people? Um, suggest a good deal of role confusion within the field. That is true, and that has been true since its beginnings. Uh, it's true in academia. It's true among the advocacy community. It's true in philanthropy. Uh, um, and, and has been for much of its existence, which has created sort of a lack of policy research and advocacy attention. As such, the subject kind of feels like a black box to a lot of people. Uh, so I wanna back up a little and go to its origins uh, so we can see if we can tease some of the issues out. So back in the 1840s, there was sort of simultaneous invention of probation and parole uh, in, in different parts of the world. Uh, Captain Alexander McConaughey uh, was put in charge of the English penal colony on Norfolk Island uh, in Australia in 1840. That's where people from England were being transported, is what they said, uh, to um, Australia as prisoners. Uh, and McConaughey inherited a very brutal prison on Norfolk Island and uh, was credited with turning it around. And part of the way he was credited with turning it around was by creating an incentive structure for people to behave well so that they could get out early. Uh, he called that originally a mark system. People would earn marks um, for good behavior. And if they earned enough marks, they could get out early. And, uh, and then they would be supervised by his uh, people on the outside. Uh, and they behaved so well upon release and the, uh, the system worked so well uh, for McConaughey that they called uh, uh, people on parole McConaughey's gentlemen. Uh, this started to travel around the world. It was replicated most broadly initially in Ireland, uh, called it the Irish system, uh, and then ultimately uh, to France and the United States. That was called uh, originally the Mark system or tickets of leave, but when it traveled to France, uh, they, they used uh, uh, the, the term parole because parole means word in French and uh, people were giving their word when they left prison. So that's the word that stuck. Meanwhile, right around the same time in 1841, John Augustus, who was a member of the temperance movement in Boston and a bootmaker, uh, started to post bail for people who were facing time in a city's house of correction. Um, and there's, a, there's still, by the way, a, uh, a marker on the street uh, in Boston, if you could find it, uh, about John Augustus's work. Uh, he's called the father of uh, probation. Um, he, mostly he was uh, bailing out people who were accused of vagrancy, alcoholism, prostitution. He did this with the court's approval, uh, with the notion that he would watch them and help them, you know, sort of uh, mend their ways for a relatively short period of time. And they returned them to court and that the court was satisfied uh, Augustus would get his bail back and those folks would go free. free. Uh, 
Over a period of several years, he and his temperance movement's colleagues, because he needed other help because he was starting to bail out so many people, um, bailed out about 2,000 people and just a handful, I think four or five uh, forfeited bail. All the rest, all the rest made it and uh, went on their way. Um, Augustus was unabashedly uh, merciful. Uh, 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 as he put it, his mission was, quote, to raise the fallen, reform the criminal, and so far as my humble abilities would allow to transform the abode of suffering and misery to the home of happiness. Um, so the foundation of probation and parole was first kind of mixed during the Enlightenment, uh, Enlightenment and poor during the Industrial Revolution, but then it concretized and grew during the Progressive Era which was an optimistic time colored by elements that were at once helpful and paternalistic. Immigrants and rural residents were pouring into US cities uh, during this time, bringing with them customs and religious beliefs that were strange and unaccustomed to the, to the Protestant white power structure, uh, which sought to acculturate and control these sort of teeming masses. Josephine Shaw Lowell was a prominent progressive whose friendly visiting, that's what they called them, efforts formed the basis of probation and parole practice. She stated, a constant and continued intercourse must be kept up between those who have a high standard and those who have it not. And that the educated and happy and good are to give some of their time regularly and as a duty year in and year out to the ignorant, miserable, and the vicious. No doubt the ignorant, miserable, and vicious appreciate this. With this mix of sort of rehabilitative and helpful intent on the one hand and paternalistic and controlling intent on the other, community supervision flourished and expanded through its first century, first century plus of existence, growing from small pilot, voluntary pilot projects to be ensconced in law and practice in all states by around the war, World War II. So here's a couple of quotes I think it's worth taking a look at and I'll, I'll get more into them. Uh, Robert Martinson uh, said uh, in the 1970s, it takes no leap of the imagination to see that these community supervision networks are impotent to deal with the kind of offender now dumped upon them. My neighbors have long regarded these probation and parole agencies as, as an affront to their common sense, a kind of standing joke. It's a far cry from uh, what McConaughey and um, uh, and Augustus were saying and believing. Uh, John Ehrlichman, uh, President Nixon's former assistant for domestic affairs, uh, wrote that the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. So from the post-war era to the 1970s, there was a swirling set of social forces that would ultimately bring the rehabilitative era of criminal justice to, to an end. The end of the war brought home a group of white soldiers looking to recapture their jobs, and black soldiers who had fought for their country who were in no mood to return to second-class status or Jim Crow restrictions. Increasing white race riots before and after the war and the migrations of millions of black people from the segregation of South to Northern, Western and Central US cities alarmed Northern whites and tensions rose. In 1964, Barry Goldwater tried to capitalize on this by openly racializing his run for president, helping him become the first Republican since reconstruction to win the South, but outside of the South, he only won his home state of Arizona. Richard Nixon and his fellow Republicans learned Goldwater's lessons. And instead of overtly racial appeals, pivoted to dog whistle tactics, racializing crime and poverty issues as code words for race as part of their newly minted Southern strategy. Nixon was victorious and in 1972 launched the war on drugs that sort of marks the unofficial start of America's march towards mass incarceration. Our prison populations rose every year from 1972 to 2008, uh, they had largely been steady uh, and not much out of uh, balance with the rest of the world. Uh, by the end 
of the growth of mass incarceration, uh, we would far outstrip our historical rates and dwarf the rates of other countries. So around that time in 1966, a little known researcher named Robert Martinson was asked to participate in a meta-analysis of the recidivism effects of prison programming in New York State. The paper, which was finalized in 1970, yielded conflicting results. Some programs worked, some programs didn't show any positive outcomes, and most were funded or implemented too poorly to discern one way or the other. The report was initially shelved due to its inconclusive nature, and that seemed to be that. Myth that the report was never published in 1974, Martin published a distillation of it under his own name and without the lead researcher's knowledge in the neoconservative journal, Public Interest, under the title, quote, What Works? The Martinson report, as it came to be known, exploded, claiming that nothing works when it comes to rehabilitating people who had broken the law. It became one of the most influential and frequently cited papers in the journal's history, landing Martinson on 60 Minutes and the front page of People magazine, which was pretty heady stuff for a previously obscure academic, especially back then, when crime was not the salient issue it is today. State after state started to eliminate prison programming, abolishing or curbing parole release, and prison populations swelled. This marked a turning point for probation and parole. Remember, they were based and, and founded on notions of rehabilitation. So supervision agencies had to pivot or chose to pivot to a more punitive and surveillance focused approach. Conditions of supervision mushroomed to an average of nearly 20 standard conditions that placed people under curfews, forbade them from traveling out of state, opened them to warrantless searches, prohibited them from associating with other people with criminal convictions, and had sort of catch-all provisions essentially requiring them to be of good character. Probation and parole officers armed themselves and donned flak jackets. Supervision began meeting out intermediate sanctions for rule violations. Intensive supervision, often accompanied by electronic monitoring and house arrest, proliferated and supervision increasingly came with a trigger finger back to incarceration to fail uh, for failure to abide by increasingly stringent and irrelevant rules. Politicians were never prepared to pay for this onslaught of punitiveness and probation and parole were always the least powerful players at the budget table. So they saw their budgets cut while their caseloads swelled and politicians increasingly criticized them for high profile failures. So now you got high caseloads, risk averse politicians, a shrinking social safety net, massive collateral consequences of convictions, an employee pool drawn increasingly from criminal justice rather than social work schools, and a public seemingly intolerant of formerly incarcerated people. This all contributed to an environment in which incarceration for technical non criminal violations became the rule rather than the exception. So much so that in a survey of people entering Texas prisons, two thirds said they'd prefer a year in prison to 10 years on probation. And a third said they'd prefer a year in prison to three years on probation. The director of a, a county, uh, a Texas County, a director of probation in Texas County told the Dallas Morning News that if given the choice between probation and prison, he himself would take prison. Part of the outcomes of this was increasingly willing, increasing willingness to charge uh, people on probation and parole user fees for government supervision. And part of it was to entirely hand supervision over to free, to the taxpayers that is, supervision uh, provided by private providers and paid for entirely by such users. So whether probation and parole were ever a true alternative to incarceration, this data from uh, uh, EV, Tim, and my report shows that from 1980 to present, community supervision was no longer supplanting incarceration, if it ever did. Probation expanding in tandem with uh, incarceration. So figure two shows the number of people sentenced to probation and parole relative to index crimes. So probation and parole's use is increasing uh, um, relative to how many people are being arrested. So the likelihood of being put on probation or parole uh, per crime rose consistently for the last 40 years, essentially. Um, probation and parole, instead of being an alternative, 
are really more and more defined by practitioners and uh, uh, academics as a tripwire to incarceration in which any misstep can trigger a revocation. One such person's Kerry Latham, who was finally paroled from California prisons after 25 years. Upon release, he received a, he received a donation of clothing from musician and activist Nipsey Hussle. When a friend of Mr. Latham, Latham's died, shortly after his release from prison, uh, he headed to Nipsey Hussle's marathon clothing store on his way to the funeral so he could look more presentable. As he was entering the store, a crowd of people surrounded Nipsey Hussle who happened to be there on that tragic day. Someone in the crowd shot and killed Mr. Hussle, wounding Mr. Latham in the process. While Mr. Latham was con convalescing at the hospital, and while President Obama and Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti were eulogizing Nipsey Hussle, Mr. Latham's parole officer slapped a technical violation on him for associating with a known gang member, Nipsey Hussle, moving him and his wheelchair to the notorious LA County Jail. He was only released by Governor Newsom after public uproar over his incarceration. So another part of the outcome of the expansion of probation and parole at a time of fiscal conservatism was increasing willingness to charge people on probation and parole user fees, quote unquote, for government supervision, including entirely handing supervision over to private probation companies whose budget was paid completely by people forcibly under supervision. In Georgia, a state in which there are almost as many people on probation and parole as live in Atlanta, Thomas Parrott stole a $2 can of beer. He was a pharmacist who had become addicted to the, the pharmaceuticals, got convicted, lost his license, lost his family, and developed a severe drinking problem. He was living in subsidized housing, uh, surviving on food stamps, and by selling his blood plasma, plasma for a pocket money. So after he stole his $2 can of beer, he represented himself because he couldn't afford the $50 public defender fee. He was fined $200 and placed on electronic monitoring and private probation with Sentinel Offender Services for 12 months at a cost of $89 for the startup fee, $39 a month to be on probation, and $12 a day for the electronic monitoring, totaling $400 a month. When he couldn't pay and sell enough blood to pay these fees, in part because he was weak from doing without food to save money to pay the fees, his arrears rose to $1,200, and he was ultimately jailed for a year for a probation violation. Mr. Barrett stated, I should not have taken that beer. I was dead wrong. But to spend 12 months in jail for stealing one can of beer, it just didn't seem right. So, all right, maybe it's not helping people turn their lives around, but maybe it's improving public safety. Uh, we, we, we report on a lot of, uh, of, of studies in both the book and the article. Um, and I just summarized two here. Amy Solomon, uh, once at the Urban Institute, now uh, 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 the head of the Office of Justice Programs at the United States Department of Justice, uh, did a careful analysis of people released from prison on parole versus people released uh, not on the parole uh, to see whether parole supervision post-prison made a difference. Uh, and she said, in fact, the public safety impact of supervision is minimal and often non-existent among the largest share release cohort, males convicted of property, drug, and violent offenses who are around 80% of the releasees. Uh, further, uh, David Harding and his colleagues found that supervision serves as a risk factor for future criminal legal system involvement due to worsened labor market outcomes and increased scrutiny. So it doesn't improve public safety, according to this research, and is actually a risk factor. Uh, I found no uh, empirical evidence uh, that either probation or parole or a combination of probation and parole improve public safety. Supervision disproportionately impacts black and brown people. Uh, Jay-Z wrote uh, after his friend Meek Mill was incarcerated for a technical parole violation for two to four years after having been on probation for 12 years, his entire uh, young adulthood in Philadelphia. Uh, 
Our criminal justice system entraps and harasses hundreds of thousands of black people every day. Instead of a second chance, probation ends up being a landmine with a random misstep bringing consequences greater than the crime. Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta, when she was president of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights said, there's an ever growing problem in our nation, revolving door of incarceration through probation or parole, supervision and the grossly inequitable treatment of black and brown people within it. It is past time that we transform probation and parole systems nationally and end the cycle of mass incarceration and the inequitable treatment of people of color. Controlling for other factors, people under supervision are, uh, uh, people of color under supervision are supervised longer, are violated, incarcerated more frequently, and overall have a harder time navigating probation and parole supervision successfully. Community supervision has been shown to provide a thin, uh, and what researchers Michelle Phelps and Ebony, Ebony Ruling call a perverse lifeline to services to desperately poor people on probation. So that's one of the, one of the positive outcomes is that uh, uh, America's uh, social service net is so thin that uh, contacts with probation officers can provide a thin lifeline. White people tend to be on probation for more serious events, suggesting it is a true alternative to carcer incarceration for them, uh, but a net widener for many people of color. More affluent people under supervision has an, have an easier time navigating supervision. They can afford their fees. They can take time off to work to sit in probation and parole offices waiting to be seen. They can transport themselves to and from meetings and other obligations. They can afford childcare while they attend supervision meetings. And they can afford representation if they are accused of a violation, which is not necessarily provided to indigent folks on probation. Many ostensibly race neutral conditions cut against people of color at its peak. One in 12 black men in the US was under supervision. One in three black Americans have a felony record. Well, let's just pause over that for a second. So a condition like avoid contact with people with criminal convictions becomes absurdly hard for people in communities that are concentrated uh, by race and poverty. In this book, I examine the impacts of supervision on communities of color by looking at its impact on people in Milwaukee. Milwaukee routinely ranks as the worst city in the country for black people to live in and containing arguably the most incarcerated zip code in the United States and the nation's first prison built entirely to incarcerate people on probation and parole. The average length of stay on parole in Wisconsin is the highest in the country, 70% higher than the national average, and an astonishing one in eight black men and one in 11 indigenous men in Wisconsin between the ages of 18 and 64 is under community supervision. Half of everyone entering Wisconsin's prisons annually are under supervision at the time of their incarceration, costing the state $148 million annually. Milwaukee's, Milwaukee's rough and Tony was one of those people. In 2019, Police stopped Mr. Tony, a black man, as he was sitting in a parked car outside a quick trip convenience store with a white woman. They observed him and the woman for 15 minutes, ran her plates, and found that she was once stopped for a driving infraction while with a man with outstanding warrants. The officer immediately learned that Mr. Tony was not that man, uh, but asked to see his ID anyway, from which they learned that he was on probation for driving while intoxicated. Mr. Tony admitted that he was in possession of cocaine, and when the officers tried to arrest him, he ran, tripped and fell, was apprehended and incarcerated. Although police dropped the charges, uh, his probation officer pursued a technical violation against Mr. Tony. Uh, he admitted to the violation, enrolled in a drug treatment program inside the Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility. Shortly before he was to complete the program, he was kicked out for, quote, failing to sufficiently accept responsibility for his drinking problem. Although he had a clean record while incarcerated in a stable home and employment, the judge sentenced him to two years in prison because he, quote, did not go deep enough in addressing why he made the choices he did to abuse alcohol and drugs. So in the paper with uh, Evie and Tim, we conducted a series of regression analyses examining the relationship between supervision rates, the prison rate, violent crime rate, and index crime. We looked at data from all 50 states over 40 years for which there were more or less reliable data. As I said, doesn't capture everything, 
Uh, we did nine multivariate models, three independent variables, probation, parole, and supervision rates, which is probation and parole combined, three dependent variables, the prison rate, the violent crime rate, and the index crime rate. And we controlled for factors like poverty, unemployment rates, racial ethnic composition of the population, political composition of state legislators, and drug arrest rates. So controlling for these other confounders, parole was significantly related to violent crime rates the current year and the following year. Probation had no statistically significant impact. So one of the two things probation and parole are supposed to do is keep us safer. Parole made us less safer. Probation had no impact. Then probation and parole and total supervision were significantly related, significantly related, significantly positive related to incarceration rates the current year and the following year. So the more people you have on probation and the more people you have on parole, the more people you incarcerate, not the less people you incarcerate. So kind of failing at its two major purposes. The evidence provides two important findings, supervision and some currently practiced is not achieving either of its dual goals of reducing incarceration and improving safety outcomes and concerted policy efforts, including legislative and practice changes are necessary to sustainably reduce the reach and punitiveness of supervision. So I'll give you two case studies. How am I doing for time, Katie? Done? You're doing great. No, you're doing great. Oh, Keep going. You shook your head. You didn't make a happy face. You made our own <laughs> I'm delighted. Continue, please. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so first is California. Um, some litigation by the prison law office against truly horrible conditions in California prisons. I think there were 200% of capacity. Uh, yielded uh, decisions by the court that California had to release prisoners, had to get down to 137.5% of capacity. So just let pause over that for a second, that being overcrowded by 37.5% was uh, what, the, what the court ordered, not, not complete releases. Um, and uh, so what happened was there was a series of bills that got passed in California, the Community Corrections uh, Performance Incentive Act, the California Public Safety Realignment Bill and Proposition 47, which is the Safe Neighborhoods and Schools Act. The Community Corrections Performance Incentive Act fiscally incentivized counties to not send people to prison for nonviolent, non-drug uh, offenses uh, that did not involve sexual offending either. Uh, and so they were forbade from sending those types of folks to prison, supervise them on probation locally or put them in jail locally, but for shorter terms. And they were given hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to pay for mental health counseling and victims uh, uh, services. The California's Public Safety Realignment Bill uh, similarly uh, realigned um, uh, some state functions to counties in exchange for returning money to the counties. And the Safe Neighborhoods and School Act downgraded uh, seven misdemeanor offenses, things like petty theft, possession of small amounts of drugs uh, to uh, become misdemeanors instead of felonies. So you couldn't go to state prison for them or be put on obviously parole because you wouldn't have gone to state prison and you would only be on misdemeanor supervision, which is generally shorter and in California, a very, very light touch, almost non-existent. Um, and again, hundreds of millions of dollars were sent to the counties so they could run victims programs, mental health programs, other block grant programs to keep themselves safe uh, in lieu of incarceration. These, uh, these bits of legislation um, had enormous impacts on California's prisons. Overall, there are 150,000 fewer people under uh, community supervision and tens of thousands of fewer people in prison as a result of these bits of legislation and as a result of continuing declines in crime. So crime went down and so did prison populations, jail populations, probation populations and parole populations and the probation revocation rate fell all during this time. The governor was so um, pleased with these outcomes that he later shortened, uh, signed legislation shortening probation terms to two years for felonies and one year for misdemeanors. 
and shorten parole terms to two years, supervision terms that is, and um, uh, allowed people to earn more time off for achieving certain milestones like getting a high school diploma or, or uh, getting certificates, things like that. Uh, so this all, you know, some states parole and probation terms are five years, 10 years. Uh, so this, this all sort of helped shrink the footprint and all during that time, uh, crime continued to decline in the Golden State. New York, I'm very familiar with because I was commissioner of probation in New York City, uh, made a series of incremental changes to its criminal legal system, uh, made durable and sizable investments in social services, social supports, social opportunities to preempt system involvement and to, to put people in, in lieu of system uh, penetration. Uh, uh, there were efforts by highly organized advocacy organizations and a network of community groups and open-minded elected and appointed officials like myself, but many DAs, many corrections commissioners in New York City uh, fit in that, um, in that category. So from, 2000, from 1996 to 2019, I, I remember New York was legendary for our, uh, our crime rates. Um, you know, people were making movies about us, uh, escape from New York, the out-of-towners, uh, things like that. Central Park was off limits after dark because people were getting mugged all the time. Uh, things were tough, tough, tough in the 90s. There were 2,200 homicides in New York City. Um, but from 1996 to 2019, uh, we experienced in New York City what Franklin Zimmering, a professor from UC Berkeley, described as the longest and, and most sustained drop in crime in, uh, in the history of any major metropolitan area. During this time, however, this did not happen, this drop in crime, because we got tough on people. It's a real important lesson for us to learn. Uh, prison populations, jail populations, probation populations, and parole populations all plummeted in New York City during this time period. 60% uh, of that decline, according to Mike Jacobson from CUNY, can be accounted for by the decline in arrests, right? Fewer people walking in the front of the courthouse, fewer people walking out to jail, but 40% couldn't, and that's really important. Uh, so what what became of that other 40%? How did that happen? Uh, so first of all, judges just started uh, reducing the sort of use of formal system uh, touches for people, uh, and particularly the deep end touches. Total case disposition declined, as I said, by 42%. Diversions and dismissals increased by 14%, while cases, while arrests, if you will, were declining by 42%. Prison sentences declined by 51%. Split sentences, which was probation and parole, dropped by 81%. And probation sentencing rates declined by 58%. At the same time, uh, my predecessors were making probation much more light touch. So when I got there, almost more than half of the people on probation were answering to a machine, like the one you see here, instead of having to sit and wait a couple of hours to see a PO and answer the same stupid five questions they asked you the week before, you'd answer those same stupid five questions to that machine and be out in five minutes. So the city made big investments and the state in, uh, in uh, social service organizations. Uh, these are a few examples of some of those groups that started to provide alternatives to incarceration and just supports for people. Um, the, the contracts for New York City were very specific that all of these groups had to show that they were actually displacing people from incarceration instead of widening this net of social control. I think that helped reduce the number of people who were incarcerated, uh, but it also, I think, inadvertently, I don't think they were intending to be alternatives to probation, but helped reduce the number of people on probation. The number of people on probation in New York in the mid-90s was 82,000 people, and it's 11,000 people now. Uh, there was also a really uh, sort of sophisticated network of uh, advocates that pushed these kinds of reforms and really made the case for less incarceration and more community supports. And they ranged from, uh, from the funders, which I think is a somewhat unique New York phenomenon. There's a lot of uh, 
big private money in New York to help spark this kind of, uh, of, of, of advocacy. Uh, but I think it's, it's a lesson to be learned for others because we're spending as government a lot of money to lock people up and we could be diverting that money to their communities to help reduce the number of people who are locked up. And then, as I said, uh, open-minded officials uh, also, uh, we expanded indigent representation. The city created uh, Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and uh, an additional New York defenders to add to uh, the Legal Aid Society and Harlem defenders. And these folks uh, all added social workers to help present alternative uh, to incarceration proposals um, at court. So I think this is sort of a, a web of changes that happened in New York that helped push down incarceration and supervision simultaneous with the reduction in crime in the city. And I, you know, I think also that the, uh, uh, the decline in crime allowed system stakeholders, allowed judges, allowed probation commissioners, allowed prosecutors to experiment with some of these alternatives in ways that uh, if, the, if the crime rates were, were rising, they might not have. Uh, and Greg Berman, the head of the Center for Court Innovation, one of, the, one of the better programs in New York, described this as a thousand small sanities. So why supervision? Uh, we concluded that if probation and parole are not improving public safety, are associated with higher incarceration rates and are accompanied by negative outcomes, it's logical to ask not only why so many people are under supervision, but also why is it used at all? Has it made the case? When I interviewed with Mayor Bloomberg and we talked about uh, probation, um, he asked me what I thought of it and I said, not much. Uh, and my answer was, if I came to you with $80 million and 30,000 troubled and troubling souls, would you go out and hire a thousand civil service protected bureaucrats to have them piss in a cup once a week and tell them to go forth and sin no more? And he said, no, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't do that. And I said, well, you know, I haven't been to your probation department, so I'm not specifically talking about you, but I'm pretty sure that's what you got right now. And he looked at, there were three deputy mayors in the room, part of the interview, and they all kind of shrugged and nodded. Uh, one of my predecessors at probation, Marty Horn, also was executive director of state parole. Marty said, if tomorrow all the parole officers in New York City were taken on a cruise for a month, would there be an appreciable change in the crime rate? To spend the kind of money the state does on parole, you'd have to be able to say there definitely would be. Marty was pretty good with his quotes. Uh, so just a couple of other quick examples. Uh, and Katie, how am I doing? Let's take five more minutes, Vinny, and then we'll move into questions. So Virginia, you know, when, when all these states were abolishing parole release around the 70s and 80s, because uh, the rehabilitative ethic was, it came, you know, under uh, criticism, Virginia took it a step further and they abolished post-release supervision. They abolished parole supervision from 1995 to 1999. Now, I don't have another random Virginia to assign uh, uh, people to, but the crime in the state continued to decline by 30% during those four years, more than neighboring North Carolina. Uh, misdemeanors are supervised very lightly or not at all. In several jurisdictions in New York City, only three tenths of a percent of misdemeanor arrests result in probation. California rarely supervises uh, misdemeanor probation and tens of thousands of additional people were added to misdemeanor roles when Prop 47 passed and crime continued to go down. So you took all these people off of felony probation and put them on misdemeanor supervision, which is pretty much nothing in California, and crime continued to decline. And then there are counties in some states, I know Arizona and Tennessee for sure, where uh, the state pays for uh, felony probation, but for misdemeanor probation, that's a local cost. And some counties have just abolished it because they can't afford it. Nothing happened. So I'm going to skip over this, and I'm going to go to uh, what I call incremental abolition. And I, I did this on purpose just to piss off both incrementalists and abolitionists, and I'm, I hope I'm successful in that regard. Um, 
But really, this, this could work, in my view, whether you're going for abolition or just a very significant downsizing. Um, my, my recommendations are to capture the savings uh, that we now, I think, waste on locking people up for technical violations. It's about one in four people entering prisons every year are coming in for a technical. Uh, it's higher in some states, like I said about Wisconsin, Minnesota, a couple other places. Um, put that money back into the communities. Get the right people on the bus right away, which means, in my view, meeting with indigenous people in those neighborhoods who are trying to work and help people right now turn their lives around, but they're doing it by holding bake sales, pulling money out of their own pockets, feeding people from church basements uh, and, and trying to help them grow a backbone. Uh, and by that, I mean, some of these nonprofits get, or, or these, these, these folks that are just helping people, they can't answer a government RFP, 150 pages. And I just came back from Colorado right before I started this job where the Latino coalition is a backbone organization. The state grants the money to the Latino coalition. Latino coalition fans out around Colorado to find people who are trying to do these kinds of good works in their own neighborhood, gives them small grants to start with, helps them with all their back office stuff, their, their accounting, their reporting to the government, helps them frame what they do, their secret sauce, in a way that the government can understand and relate to and fund, and then provides them with a, a float. So that, you know, because a lot of times when you get a government grant, I don't know how many of you have ever gotten one, it takes like six months before the first check comes. Well, you know, you can't, you can't survive on that if, if, you know, if you're not a big organization. Uh, so the Latino coalition does the float for them. Uh, they have enough money stored up so they can pay them immediately and they wait for the money to come from the state. Show me the money. Like I said, you got you to gotta move the money from decarceration into communities. You can't just capture it all and cut taxes and fill potholes. Uh, race matters. You have to pay attention to um, reducing this. We're not going to just inadvertently reduce racial disparities. We have to be deliberately anti-racist. We have to pay attention to what kinds of programs we're running, where we're running them. Are they culturally relevant? Are they meeting the needs of the people in the various different communities, including communities of color that are wildly disproportionately uh, incarcerated and supervised. Start with your principles. Don't start with your widgets. Far too much of what what um, what masquerades as reform is, is sort of point score systems and contacts of people on probation. Like that's not going to get us out of this. Maybe we'll use some of that stuff once we start with principles that say that people should be treated with decency and fairly. Uh, but if we start with widgets, we're going to end with widgets. Uh, and then follow the data and share it. Don't, don't hide your data. Uh, the, the government uh, is famous for doing that. It, it, it engenders a tremendous amount of distrust in communities. It also uh, engenders distrust in fellow uh, sister agencies and amongst the courts and prosecutors. If you can't be transparent with your data, everybody somewhat rightly assumes that you're hiding stuff. Um, Marty's alternative path, by the way, which I think is interesting and worth taking a look at, uh, is instead of doing all that stuff, which is sort of government organized, Marty just said, give them, give them several thousand dollars worth of vouchers when they come out, let them crowdsource uh, and see what folks coming out of prison, empowered with their own resources, decide to do with those resources. I think that Probation and parole have been around for a long time. There's been a lot of people who have over the centuries uh, tried to reform them. Uh, and yet at the end of that, in my view, that dog won't hunt. It really is not, uh, there's not strong evidence that it either uh, reduces uh, crime or uh, reduces incarceration. Uh, and uh, so it hasn't proven itself. And I'm very skeptical of people who say, well, just one more chance on this even though I'm a big second chance guy. Um, and I think other options, shrinking, abolishing, shifting money through a planned uh, uh, effort like what I described or crowdsourcing like what Marty suggested are at least, at least worth giving a shot and honestly uh, study. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for that.
It was a great march through the piece and uh, insight into your upcoming book. I know we said, and uh, I'll continue to say, we want questions from the audience and we already have at least one in the chat um, and folks can either raise their hands or um, drop those questions in the chat and we'll, we'll let you ask them yourself. I certainly have some prepared too. So happy to start with Josh Dankoff if you wanna unmute and ask your question and then we can fill in from there. I think Josh is still on, but I don't um, see him unmuting. So in that interest, I I'm happy to read the question, which is any commentary, Vinny, on GPS or ankle monitoring and its trends and impacts on outcomes, is it also overused and or unhelpful? Yeah, I mean, I, I, from what, I, what I've what i seen of research, I didn't really sort of plow into this because other people have written books on this. What I've seen of it is that like intensive supervision, uh, which has been studied pretty extensively and I do talk about in the book, uh, it tends to not improve outcomes, either um, rehabilitative outcomes or, or recidivism outcomes, uh, and it uh, contributes to revocations and uh, returns to incarceration. So yeah, I know it makes people feel good, just like probation and parole make elected officials feel like at least something is happening, but I think after all this time, we, we really need more than that. Thanks for that. Go ahead, Henna. Thanks, Katie. Um, thanks for this talk. I, my name's Henna Rafiki, and I work for the Kennedy School's Government Performance Lab, and I work on providing technical assistance to pre trial agencies. And it feels like a lot of the trends you've mentioned show up a lot in the pre trial work, and it feels like pre trial agencies are often just replicating the harms that probation systems and are just copying and pasting, although it's a very different system. And I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit on how you expect to see pre-trial reforms happen and what you think people like myself who are working on providing support to agencies should be really focused on. And, and where are you, Hannah? I'm currently working with um, the Illinois Office of Statewide Pre-trial Services. So we all work remotely, but I was previously working with Harris County. Great. Um, so, you know, I, I, I thought that one of the good things about having so many advocates and, and having the courts and prosecutors have gained trust over time in New York is that it allowed us to push the envelope on a lot of stuff. And I thought that even before bail reform passed, um, we had a pretty good system of getting in immediately, evaluating people for whether they were or were not at risk of running away, getting those recommendations to the courts, and then when they set bail, if they set bail, trying to hustle their families to get down there and post it. And it was a really kind of aggressive effort to make all that stuff happen. So then um, when the city decided to close Rikers, uh, which it did, uh, I think in the second year of Mayor de Blasio's term, um, the, uh, you know, the largest number of people in Rikers were in pre-trial, so they stood up um, a network of pre-trial service agencies and they, they really heavily negotiated it with our excellent defender groups and kept it very light touch, very reminder focused uh, rather than surveillance focused and very uh, attachment to services focused if people wanted to voluntarily. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of a I'm kind of a less is more person on pretrial supervision. Um, I don't think we're going to cure people, nor should we. They haven't been convicted of anything. Pretrial, if they want access to services, we should help them get them. Uh, but we should definitely not load them down with conditions, uh, and we should help help them remember to get to court because a lot of times people just don't go because they forget or they get the wrong day and all that kind of stuff. Thanks for that. I have a, a kind of follow up question that I think dovetails well with that topic, which is, you know, in the paper and, and in your talk, you spoke about how your predecessors at the Department of Probation and then your own work, Vinny, there focused in part on um, requiring early termination being initiated by POs, discouraging revocation as an agency practice, right? These kind of discretionary uh elements of monitoring that was done by individual probation officers. So I'm wondering 
so much of the discussion about reform right now in the absence of legislative intervention talk about those same kinds of discretionary initiatives, whether led by district attorney's offices or led by parole agencies or mm -hmm. probation agencies, right, where it depends on the actual realization of those policies in the practice of a courtroom. Um, and I'm wondering how you can effectively monitor and manage personnel to ensure that that policy is being carried out. And in particular, in line with what you just said at the end of your presentation about the importance of intentional attention towards race and racial disparities. What are the ways that agencies can do that kind of monitoring with that intention in mind? Great questions. Um, so I just, I prefer legislative fixes to, to uh, policy, you know, policy fixes because, you know, if I get hit by a truck, who knows what the next person's gonna do. And I think we're gonna see the, uh, whether whether some of that changes under under Mayor Adams, who's a little tougher on crime uh, than Mayor de Blasio, but I was Mayor Bloomberg's commissioner, so it wasn't like he was exactly soft on crime. I just was able to talk him into some of this stuff because he was a big evidence guy. Well, uh, and but, as your research shows, that, that whole framing, tougher on crime or not, is itself a question, right? Sorry to interrupt, but just wanted to note that we use that shorthand, but um, actually what's producing safety, right? Yeah, good question. I mean, so, one of the things we did was we did have the ability to go back to the judges and ask for early discharge. And I think we were using it three per, in 3% of the cases. And what I said to the mayor was, there's a lot of meaningless stuff that goes on in government, but I challenge you to find a more meaningless expenditure of government dollars than that last year of a five-year probation term on a guy that's been doing fine for four years. It's getting you nothing. You're just wasting money. And you're blowing this guy's day because a lot of times you have to wait like two, two and a half hours because the PO is all stacked up. And so, you know, that was a kind of business way of approaching it. So we increased early discharges sixfold. I did it by in a couple of ways. One was I was constantly trying to sell stuff to my staff. So I wasn't just going to issue policies. I was sitting down. I was explaining them. I was showing them the data. Um, I was saying how incentives work better then you know, threats of punishment, and that when you poll people on probation and ask them, what do they want? The answer is off probation. So it's a big incentive we have at our disposal. And so we then set up a work group and they came back with recommendations and I ensconced those recommendations into policy after I got them back from staff. So this way staff weren't hanging out there. And, and they were, if X, if there's X amount of time, I don't remember the details, uh, that a person on high risk behaves well, you drop them down to medium risk, then down to low risk, and if they're doing well there, and it's like six months, six months, six months, we go back to court and ask for early discharge. So, you know, we, we, we dropped a lot of people on probation, and then I asked the state, which had the data on how my people were doing, to compare how people discharged early did versus people who stayed on for the whole time, and people discharged early had lower rearrest rates uh, post release than people who stayed on for the full term. Bloomberg was happy with that. That's always a thing that makes him happy, uh, and and so that was good. The state on parole was the one of the one of the had one of the highest numbers of parole revocations in the country, uh, incarceration for parole revocations. When I was at Columbia, we did a study, and it cost six hundred and eighty million dollars. Uh, worth of, of technical parole violations in New York. So that, that paper was called Less is More, and uh, advocates then uh, drafted a Less is More Act to eliminate most technicals. And then when, if people did get violated, they had the ability to go before a court before they were detained, not before the parole board, but before a court. And the court would decide whether they should be held while they were awaiting their adjudication of their violation. And then if they did get violated, the terms were one week for the first violation, two weeks for the second violation, and never more than a month for the third violation. And on the flip side, if they didn't get a violation, every 30 days they didn't get a violation, they got 30 days cut off of their uh, parole term. So if you never got violated and you had three years of post-release parole supervision, you were done in 18 months. Uh, when we wrote that paper, and I think it was 2018, 2019, there were 800 people in Rikers Island for technical violations. That was the only population that was increasing. Last time I looked, last month, there were 12 people. 
So um, I prefer the legislative fix because it's a little more durable, but there's tons of stuff we can do as commissioners ourselves to, to help people out. We've got a flurry of questions now, Vinny. So I'm gonna <clears throat> um, just ask one quick follow-up from Sandy Jones. Sandy, do you wanna ask your question? I'll go ahead and ask it. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, I just couldn't get to the mute button fast That's enough. That's fine. I just wondered how the judiciary responded when you um, made you know, the, the efforts toward early supervision release. So we, before we did it, we went and spoke with all the judges. We actually did two things with the judges. It was really cool. Um, there were 15,000, uh, so I had 30,000 people on supervision and 15,000 people out on warrants, right? Because they had stopped coming to probation some decades ago. So we, we, we started to talk to the judges about both of these things. On the warrants, fortunately, my, my general counsel was a former homicide prosecutor, so he had a lot of you know, cred. Wayne McKenzie, who just recently finished being the uh, head of the um, um, American Bar Association's criminal justice section. Um, and so we went in and we pitched him and said, look, what if, what if these 15,000 people walked into your court, threw their hands up in the air and said, I surrender? What would you do? Um, because if they're out for all this time on abscondence, we, we issue warrants immediately. We tell the courts and they issue warrants. So that meant they were out there not committing crimes because there was one thing NYPD was really good at. It was doing warrant checks on people they stopped. They weren't even getting stopped. So uh, the judge said, you know, I said, would you lock them up? Would you put them back on probation? The judge said, no, we, we, we terminate probation. I said, well, what if we just bring those cases, 100 of those cases to you every month and ask for early termination for it? We just terminate the warrants. And that's what we did. All five boroughs, 100 cases a month for many, many months. I, I don't know what the final count was, but it was thousands of people didn't have warrants anymore. On the flip side, with early discharges, the judges just weren't used to them. Uh, and they, you know, they only got them uh, for people who had money and had paid lawyers because you know, most of the people on probation, the last time they were in court, it wasn't a good experience. So they weren't like running back to court. Um, and so, you know, we, we kind of carefully worked with the judges and talked to them about it, and they were pretty cool with it. They trusted us. Also, you know, liability largely then falls on us, political liability, because we made, we made the recommendation. So, you know, I was telling them, I'm willing to stand up on this. So they knew that if, if something bad happened, at least we'd share the beating that we would take in the New York Post. Thanks for that. We've got about five minutes left and we've got, I don't know, at least a question a minute coming in. So um, I think the order in which I, I saw these hands, Felix has a question earlier in the chat and then Sandra had a hand up um, and then uh, Lloyd and then Simon, that's our order. So Felix, why don't you take us off? Maybe we can ask all the questions now and then we can kind of, is that easier for you, Vinny, so that you kind yeah, of have sure. a, a stream? All right, so go ahead, Felix. Hey, Vinny, uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, I had a quick question about the rise of uh, risk assessment in this space and whether you think it had sort of any impact at all. Um, I can imagine um, that there are some that are just based on you know expert opinions or whatever and might not be much of a departure, but I know some of them are supposed to be data-driven. I'm just curious if you think that had any impact on either whether these were effective tools or racial disparities um, in how they're being deployed. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Sandra. So um, thank you so much for a terrific talk. I can't wait for the book, um, which I expect a signed copy of. Um, <laughs> on race matters, that's right. On race matters, it would be great if you could share um, uh, examples of, of reforms that um, were intentionally uh, designed and implemented with racial equity in mind. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and give us a sense too of what happens when we don't do that. Like, wh why is it that we could have reforms that we think should matter and end up increasing racial disparities if we don't take, if we aren't, if we aren't intentional? I think um, this is piggybacking off of one uh, um, point that Katie made earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Lloyd, go ahead. Uh, I'm curious about what uh, relationship um, 
if any, that uh, that you perceive between police reform, and I'm thinking here of uh, Commissioner Bratton, Bratton's time uh, in, in New York City, um, uh, and the decline in crime which occurred uh, during, that, uh, dur during that period, the relationship between uh, police reform and the reforms that you described. And then finally, we've got Simon. And I, again, Vinny, I know it's limited time, so we'll, we'll see how much you can speak to each of these. Okay, very different questions. Uh, great presentation, Vinny. Uh, any thoughts about uh, parole decision-making and also uh, the incentive that it may provide probation as well in terms of uh, needed treatment? All righty. I'll do my best on these. Let me start with the first two. I'm going to try and say them together. I want to just add one other point um, in addition to all this other stuff. Part of what I think is important about uh, working together with communities to uh, um, co-design uh, what kind of services, supports, and opportunities people get in lieu of confinement is that it builds more cohesive communities and informal social controls. And I just wanna tip my hat to Rob Sampson for the work he's done on that. That greatly influenced uh, a big part of the book and, and Pat Sharkey too. Um, and uh, so I think that you know a lot of our systems, we focus, we hyper-focus on individuals because that's the way the legal system structure is set up. Uh, you did a bad thing, I'm dealing with you. you next one did a bad thing, next one did a bad thing. I think it's a lot easier to find violent places than violent people. And I think if we could do more to uplift the places, we'd have a lot fewer violent people, probation and parole notwithstanding, treatment notwithstanding, you know, all that other stuff. So on risk assessment and race, I want to put those two answers together for a second. Um, I did a paper uh, with uh, um, a, a, a bunch of co-authors, Elizabeth Hinton Hoyt and um, uh, Jason Zeidenberg and Brenda, um, God, I can't believe I'm going to Brenda's last name, uh, for the Casey Foundation. We evaluated the four, uh, the four or five sites they had been doing this juvenile detention alternatives initiative, and two of them had stopped having racial disparities after the cops brought the kids to the front gate of detention, whereas previously racial disparities kept exacerbating. After that point, more kids of color got detained. Then they got uh, adjudicated delinquent or convicted more frequently. They got placed in deeper in uh, programs frequently, and they were able to stop that. And they it wasn't and there was no home run. It was a lot of doubles and singles. One of them, to, to Felix's question, was risk assessment instruments, and they really took very <laughs> careful looks at their risk assessment instruments. They evaluated all. They they created their own, and then they evaluated any one of them that was exacerbating disparities, and then compared. So they, they, they put a racial lens on it um, and said, is the benefit of, of predictability worth the cost of racial disparities? So examples were uh, gang membership or did a, did a family member show up at the detention hearing? That's actually a very big predictor of the kid not showing up. If a family member didn't show, it's a big predictor, but intact middle-class families have the ability to show up at hearings that single moms who've already taken three, four days off because of this process don't. And so they then expanded the deaf. And also some kids aren't living with their parents. They're living with a guardian or a grandmother or an aunt. And so they expanded that. They eliminated gang membership, right? And then they tested what kind of impact did that have on failure to report and what kind of impact did it have on racial disparities? So that's one thing they did. The other thing is they started putting the services in the kids' own communities run by culturally relevant organizations. And then they expanded the number of social workers at the public defender's office so they could fight the way middle-class families fight for their kids when they come before the law so that they had advocates in there instead of being standing there all by themselves. And then finally, they did a major, major effort to accelerate case processing. Uh, one of the people I interviewed said, um, uh, what, was the, what was the quote? 
uh, racial disparities flourish in a sloppy system. White kids just don't sit around in detention for a really long time waiting for a placement. If my son was arrested, I'd find him a damn placement fast. I'd take my credit card out and pay for it. And kids who are poor, who are disproportionately going to be kids of color, don't have that ability. So when they did all of that, what it basically did was it stopped. It stopped making it worse. They didn't go before that to arrest because the police weren't part of the JDI initiative. Um, but at least it didn't get worse at the front door. I equivocate in the book on, on risk assessments. I kind of put both sides of the argument. I really, I wrote that chapter 20 different times and sent it to a bunch of different people. I just don't know the damn answer to this. I really don't. Uh, I, it's hard for me to know what's worse, a risk assessment instrument that conglomerates all the racial disparities that people experience and over-policing in their communities and all that kind of stuff, or the gut instinct of my probation officers. Uh, and so my point that I make in the end of that chapter is, it to me, at the end of this, we're pretending that we are creating some sort of scientific approach to what's a crappy service at the end of the day. And this gets to my treatment, which is, I think, I understand how, so I'm pivoting to the treatment one. I understand uh, how, uh, you know, Phelps and Rulin talk about uh, probation as a sort of thin lifeline to social services. And I just think that's pathetic that we're, we're standing up this, this massive bureaucracy to provide a lousy connection to social services for people. And I, I think that my recommendations in the end are just better than that. We, we can do better than hiring this, this, this sort of quasi law enforcement group bearing guns and the ability to look through your underwear drawer while you're sitting on your couch with your girlfriend and embarrassing you and your kids. Um, I think we can do better than have that be our social service delivery vehicle to poor black and brown people. And I think we damn well should. Uh, and then finally, who the hell knows whether uh, Bratton's police reforms were what did it? That's really not my expertise. It's not my book. I'm not sure it did. I suspect that there is, like there was with prisons, some suppression value to um, to those kinds of tactics, I suspect they come at high costs. Uh, and I wonder what could have been done uh, with alternative approaches. But what I know it didn't do, and what I know didn't happen in New York City, it's very, the evidence is super clear on this, is there was a massive reduction in crime. I mean, that went from 2,200 homicides to it was below 300 before the pandemic. Uh, and that's true for robberies and car thefts and in every category of crime. So it went down. What it was not, I don't know exactly what it was, but what it was not was an increased use of incarceration or supervision because all of those plummeted right alongside. Thank you for that, Vinny. Thank you for a phenomenal talk. I know we kept you over by five minutes and really appreciate you taking the extra time with us. Um, and I'll just add one final note on that last point, which is that one of the things that the review piece notes is that there was a lot of advocacy and agitation around some of the particular punitive excess of the kind of broken windows regime and the stop and frisk practices, right, and, and highlights the Floyd litigation and other litigation in, in New York City to combat some of the uh, kind of most racially disproportionate elements of that policing regime. So just want to note that there is some talk about that in the paper that I really enjoyed. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. And I know we're all eager to read the book. Um, and everyone else will hopefully see you back here in about a month for our next event in the series and keep staying tuned and, uh, and have a great evening, everyone.